The body has developed several means of protecting itself from injury and infection. These systems, innate immunity and adaptive immunity, complement each other and provide us with protection from a wide variety of injur injurious organisms. Immunity means inf protection from infectious disease. The innate immune system is also known as the natural or nonspecific system, and the adaptive immune system is also known as the specific or acquired immunity. We are born with a variety of innate barriers. These include mechanical removal, such as tears, ciliary action, coughing, anatomical barriers, such as skin and mucous membranes, and chemical barriers, such as gastric acid and lysozyme. These barriers work by keeping pathogenic organisms out of the body or by destroying them if they do enter. If our barriers are penetrated, other innate or nonspecific defenses come into play. These defenses are nonspecific. They function against a variety of pathogens. They are also able to distinguish between self and non-self. They do not distinguish between pathogens. They simply react against something that is perceived as non-self. This type of defense includes such things as species resistance, complement, and interferon. Species resistance is what keep hum keeps humans and other animals from developing Dutch elm disease. We have natural resistance to that fungus. We also have natural resistance to many diseases which affect other animal species, such as feline leukemia. We do not have species resistance against the rabies virus, which can attack a variety of warm-blooded species. However, trees do have resistance, species resistance against rabies. Interferons are proteins that are produced by cells when they are infected by a virus. Interferons don't destroy the viruses, but they keep them from invading additional healthy cells. The complement system consists of several plasma proteins which are activated when they come in contact with bacteria or the antibodies that our bodies produce against foreign substances and organisms. It is a series of reactions called the complement cascade. The complement cascade has four main functions. It causes opsonization when pieces of complement stick to the surface of a pathogenic microorganism and make it easier for them to be engulfed by phagocytosis. It also um, does chemotaxis, and chemotaxis is when uh, neutrophils and other, uh, other white blood cells will be attracted to an area. Some components of the complement system form complexes that create pores in bacterial membranes. This leads to cell lysis. Complement also contributes to inflammation, which is described in the next PowerPoint. We have several types of macrophages and neutrophils which phagocytize various pathogens which may enter our bodies. Let's talk about some of the cells that are used in innate immunity. The main phagocytic cells are involved in, that are involved in innate immunity are monocytes. They leave the blood and take up residence in most tissues where they live a relatively long time. Monocytes will engulf and kill invading microorganisms. They also cause inflammation. Basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils are granulocytes. They tend to live for a shorter time. The neutrophils especially are efficient phagocytes. Dendritic cells are found in the skin and most other organisms. They have long finger-like processes. Once they engulf a pathogen, they usually take it to the lymphatic system. They also act as antigen-presenting cells, which help start the production of antibodies in the adaptive immune response. Natural killer cells are a type of lymphocytes. They act against anything they consider to be an antigen. Unlike other lymphocytes, which act only against specific antigens. Natural killer cells attack viruses. They also recognize and kill stressed and abnormal cells in the body, such as cancer and tumor cells, and cells which have been affected with intercellular pathogens. Natural killer cells work by releasing chemicals which make holes in the cell membranes of the cells being attacked by the natural killer cells. If the innate mechanisms do not work, then we have to use adaptive or specific immunity. 
It comes into play after the innate responses have been activated. It works with the innate system to protect us from disease. Both the innate and the adaptive immune system are vital to our protection. Inflammation is a relatively rapid, nonspecific, and short-lived reaction. Adaptive immunity is slower acting, specific, and very long-lived. Adaptive immunity is a specific response to a specific antigen. Specific immunity involves the lymphocytes and the products they produce, known as antibodies. Antigens are molecules which react with the immune system. There are two types, foreign and self-antigens. Self-antigens will cause an autoimmune response, which we will talk about later. An epitope is the portion of a molecule which will bind with cells or antibodies. It is a unique molecular shape that it is recognized by the receptor on the surface of the antibody. Here are some characteristics of the specific or adaptive immune system that you need to know. Adaptive immunity is not only specific to the antigen it is attacking, it also distinguishes self from non-self. In addition, the specific or adaptive immune system has memory, and it recognizes antigens it has come in contact with before. This memory allows it to make a swift response to an antigen it has encountered before. Specific or adaptive immunity can be amplified or suppressed by external factors such as trauma, pollutants, radiation, drugs, chemo, and also by internal factors such as age, gender, nutritional status, genetic background, and reproductive status. The cells involved in specific immunity are the lymphocytes. They originate in the spleen and liver of the fetus and in the bone marrow of children and adults. They are slightly larger than erythrocytes. Lymphocytes must be made immunocompetent or activated. B lymphocytes become immunocompetent in bone marrow. They are involved in humoral or antibody-mediated immunity. Humoral immunity is our defense against extracellular microbes and toxins. T lymphocytes, on the other hand, become immunocompetent in the thymus. And this is where these uh, lymphocytes get their name, T for thymus, B for bone marrow. T lymphocytes are involved in cell-mediated immunity, which is against intracellular microbes. 99% of the lymphocytes are located in the lymph vessels and nodes. This is a location that will be very likely to bring them in contact with pathogens or foreign materials. Antigen-presenting cells are cells which engulf antigens, break them up, and display part of the antigen on their own surface, the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. They are usually either macrophages or dendritic cells. Macrophages are, most of the macrophages are monocytes. They are found in the blood and wandering through our tissues. They act as phagocytes. They can also cause inflammation and attract other cells to the area by releasing very ke various chemicals. Neutrophils also act as phagocytes. Some people consider phagocytes and macrophages to be terms with the same meaning. Others, including the author of your text, distinguish between this term. I really don't get excited about it and tend to use the terms interchangeably, phagocyte and monocyte. Dendritic cells have long processes that extend outwards and between neighboring cells. There are lots of them in, the, in our skin and in most organs. They will migrate to the lymph nodes where they function as antigen-presenting cells. There are two types of adaptive or selective immunity, humoral and cell-mediated. We will discuss humoral, also known as antibody-mediated immunity, first. It involves B lymphocytes and acts against bacteria, viruses, and bacterial toxins. B lymphocytes will produce antibodies. We need to think about how B cells are formed. Clonal diversity is when different types of B cells are produced. It takes place in the bone marrow and the thymus. It is driven by hormones and results in the production of lymphocytes which can recognize almost any antigenic molecule. Clonal diversity happens mostly in the fetus, but it continues at a low level throughout our adult lifespan. 
Cells that are autoreactive are destroyed. Autoreactive means they react with their own antigens. This removal of autoreactive cells happens during embryonic development. If the process does not work correctly, we can end up having an autoimmune condition. As a result of clonal diversity, we have a large number of immunocompetent cells which can react with an antigen, but so far have not met that antigen. The average person has about 100 million different kinds of B cells. Clonal selection is when one type of B cell is produced in large numbers. This depends upon contact with an antigen. Once the B cell makes contact with a foreign antigen, it forms a clone that is specifically against that one antigen. The result, of plasma B, the result is plasma B cells which can produce antibodies plus memory cells. Here we see clonal selection taking place. Once the B cell has met an antigen which it recognizes, it starts to divide rapidly forming a clone. This process is aided by helper T cells. Here we see the helper T cell that is releasing cytokines which stimulate proliferation of the B lymphocytes. Two types of B cells are produced, plasma B cells which produce antibodies and memory B cells which remember the antigen and how to deal with it quickly. Now let's think a little bit about antibodies. Antibodies are glycoproteins. Their basic stru structure is two identical light chains and two identical heavy chains. They usually form a Y-shaped molecule. The forked ends of the molecule have regions called FAB, standing for antigen binding fragment. They give the antibi antibody specific specificity. Sorry about that. On the tail end of the molecule is the FC, or crystalline fragment. This area is responsible for interactions with complement, for the transport of maternal antibodies to the fetus, and for bi binding to cells involved with inflammation. Believe me when I say I expect you to know this terminology. Here we see an illustration of antigen antibody specificity. The antigen fits into the antibody binding fragment on the end of the antibody molecule. Notice that each antigen binding fragment is specific, that is, it has a different shape. Antigen 1 could not bind to antibody 2 because it's the wrong shape. Now let's consider the various types of antibodies. I will expect you to know a characteristic of two of each type of antibody. Antibodies or immunoglobulins are divided into five different classes. They're named using the letters IG, which stands for immunoglobulin. Again, I will expect you to know a characteristic of each group. IgG is the main antibody in the secondary immune response. It is also called gamma globulin. It is the most abundant group of antibodies. It makes up about 75 to 85 percent of the antibodies that are circulating in the body. Because this type of antibody can cross the placenta, it is also the main class of antibodies circulating in the blood of the fetus and the newborn child. The IgG antibodies help protect the newborn for the first few weeks of life by giving it passive immunity. IgG is responsible for precipitation, complement activations, agglutination, and obstinization. Hopefully you remember obstinization is when bacteria is coated with a substance that makes it easier for the phagocytes to recognize and engulf it. Phagocytes will have receptors for the antibody on their crystalline end. This type of antibody is also responsible for Precipitation, when antigens settle out of solution. Agglutination, when antigens clump together, such as viruses or bacteria, will stick to each other and thus be inactivated. And complement activation, when proteins making up the complement system are activated. It will also start inflammation. Here we see G antibodies being transported through the placenta. Transport through the placenta is active transport. The mother the maternal antibody binds to crystalline fragment receptors on the surface of the cell in the tropoblast of the placenta. It is enclosed in a vacuole by endocytosis. 
then receptors on the tropoblast or placenta are specific for the crystalline fragment of the G antibody. They will not bind with other classes of antibodies. The interaction of the G antibody with the receptors protects the antibody from digestion during transportation of the vacuole through the cell. Then on the fetal side of the uh, placenta, the antibody is released by exocytosis. Antibodies in the M class make up about 10% of the antibodies produced. They are the largest molecules of the five classes. They each one has five, each molecule has five functional binding sites. This is the main antibody for the primary immune response, and it is the first type of antibody produced by a newborn. Therefore, the presence of M class antibodies in the blood of a newborn baby is an indication of infection because the newborns would have some G class from their mother, but they were making their own M class. The function of the M class antibodies is they activate complement. The A group of antibodies are mostly found in body secretions such as saliva, breast milk, nasal and respiratory, and vaginal secretions. The A class antibodies help prevent viral or bacterial invasions. They keep the viruses and the bacteria from attaching to epithelial cells and this stops them before they actually enter the bloodstream. They are important in preventing the infection of mucosal tissues. The group A antibodies accounts for about 15% of the antibodies produced. The last two groups of antibodies are produced in fairly small amounts. Group D antibodies are found in developing B lymphocytes where they function as antigen receptors. They help with the differentiation of B cells. Only tiny amounts are produced. Group E antibodies are the main antibody for allergic reactions and parasitic worm infections. The group E antibodies will initiate an inflammatory reaction that will attract eosinophils to the area. And the eosinophils then will attack the, para the parasites. So this helps protect the host from infection by parasites. Group E antibodies are also the primary cause of common allergies. It takes only small amounts of the trigger substances such as hay fever, dust allergies, and bee stings to produce, to cause the release of histamines. There are four main functions of antibodies. Toxin neutralization occurs when the antibodies attach to toxins and cause them to settle out of solution. We call this precipitation. This renders the toxins unable to cause further damage. A second function is viral neutralization and agglutination. Antigen binding fragments attach to receptors on the environment, on the virus, and then they either surround the virus so it cannot attach to a cell, this would be neutralization, or the antibody causes the viruses to clump together, rendering them harm harmless. This would be the agglutination. In obstinization, the antibody molecules coat a bacterium so that it can be engulfed by macrophages. Here we see obstinization taking place. The crystalline fragment of the antibodies fits into receptors on the macrophage. The antigen binding fragment of the antibodies fits into receptors on the bacterium. And so the bacterium is held in place while it's engulfed. The fourth function of antibodies is that they activate the complement system. The complement chemicals then cause obstinization, cause chemotaxis, which attracts neutrophils to the area, or cause cell membranes to rupture, which results in the death of the cell. We will be talking more about complement in the inflammation PowerPoint. Let's talk about what happens once our body meets an antigen. The first time that we meet an antigen, we make the primary immune response. The primary immune response takes about 5 to 10 days until we get the full antibody production. The second time we make the, meet the same antigen, we make the secondary immune response. This is much faster. Uh, and we also produce a larger amount of antibodies. Vaccines take advantage of the primary immune response so that when we meet the pathogen again, we can make the secondary response. This chart illustrates some of the characteristics of the primary and the secondary immune response. The primary or first response is much slower than the secondary immune response. The primary response occurs when the immune system first comes in contact with the new antigen. 
The primary response also produces a smaller amount of antibodies than the secondary response. We use this much faster secondary immune response when we give people vaccinations. The first response is mild because we are using dead or attenuated viruses or bacteria or attenuated toxins. And so we um, get very little physical symptoms. Maybe we'll run a little bit of a fever, get a little bit of swelling at the site of the injection, so some inflammation. When we meet the virus or bacterium the second time, we are ready to make this faster secondary response. And we usually are unaware we have come in contact with the antigen the second time because the antibodies are made so fast and in such large amounts, the pathogen is destroyed before it can make a cell. Do you remember what attenuated means? When we are thinking about immunity, we need to consider how we can tell the difference between self and non-self. The main way we do this is by means of chemicals making up the major histocompatibility complex. The major histocompatibility complex molecules are also called human leukocyte antigens. These are recognition molecules found on the surface of a person's cell. They allow us to distinguish self from non-self. This knowledge, of course, is very important when we're considering, considering giving a person a transplanted tissue. There are two classes of major histocompatibility molecules. Class I major histocompatibility molecules are surface glycogens that react with antigen receptors on bacteria and viruses that infect cells, and they also react with cancer cells. In addition, they will react with the cluster of differentiation 8 molecules on cytoxic T cells. Once class I molecules pick up the antigen, it indicates to the cytoxic T cell that something is wrong with the affected, infected cell and that it needs to be destroyed. Class I major histocompatibility molecules are involved in the rejection of foreign tissues and the killing of viral infected cells. Cluster of differentiation molecules are proteins that are found on B and T cells and they form during the maturation of the B and T cells. We will be considering them on future slides. Let's talk about how that recognition goes. On the right, we see a major histocompatibility 1 receptor that has part of the virus, called an epitope, attached to it. This will react with the cytoxic T cell's receptor. The cytoxic T cell is the top cell on the right. The major histocompatibility molecules are fitting into the receptors on the different T cells. The cluster of differentiation 8 molecule will help to stabilize the connection. A cytoxic T cell can only recognize the foreign antigen if it is presented by means of the class 1 molecule. When it gets this message, the cytoxic T cells know it is to attack. Do you remember what an epitope is? Class 2 MHC molecules are found on antigen presenting cells such as macrophage and dendritic cells and also on B lymphocytes. The macrophages put part of the antigen's protein on their MHC2 molecules and show it to the helper T cells. This causes the helper T cells to divide rapidly or clone. This will also help other immune cells respond to the presence of antigens. The class II molecules react with the CD4 receptors on helper T cells. I would certainly know the difference between these two classes. Here we see an antigen presenting cell with antigen on its MHC2 receptor. It is attaching to the receptor on the helper T cell. The CD4 molecule stabilizes the connection as seen in the next slide. The antigen is a fragment of whatever the antigen presenting cell has engulfed. The T cell receptor on a helper T cell is binding with the MHC molecule of an antigen presenting cell. The T cell receptor is composed of two polypeptides that form a group that the antigen MHC molecule can fit into. The CD4 molecule on this helper T cell is stabilizing the junction. The CD8 molecule on cytoxic T cells does the same thing, stabilizes the junction. Once this binding has occurred, it is the signal for, cell for T cell differentiation or cloning. 
CD4 proteins are a cluster of differentiation molecules that form on T cells during maturation in the thymus. Don't get overwhelmed by these CD molecules. I just want you to know what they do, that they stabilize the connection between the helper T cells and the antigen presenting cells, or between the cytoxic T cells and the antigen presenting cells. Antigen presenting cells include Kupfer cells in the liver, macrophages in the lung and lymphatic system, dendritic cells in the skin and the lymphatic tissue, which have many far-reaching processes. They engulf and digest antigens, process the antigens, and present them to B and T lymphocytes. Part of the antigen binds to the MHC molecule on the surface of the antigen-presenting cell. Antigen-presenting cells will secrete a cytokine, interleukin-1, which stimulates helper T cells to, to multiply. The helper T cells have receptors for this chemical. Cytokines are chemicals involved in cell-to-cell -cell communication. This shows us an antigen presenting cell. Notice the fragment of the antigen is, jo is joined to an MHC molecule. The antigen presenting cell engulfed the antigen, broke it up, and now displays a portion of it on its, on its surface attached to the MHC molecule. The second type of immune response we make is cell mediated immunity. This involves the T cells. Activation of the cell-mediated portion of the immune response begins with the binding of an antigen to a specific T-cell receptors. The T-cell will form a clone, and several types of T-cells will be formed. We will be discussing the various types shortly. T-cells pr protect against fungal, intercellular bacteria, protozoans, and viral infections. T-cells are matured in the thymus. At that time, there is a rearrangement of genes which gives them a unique T-cell receptor. Here we see the T-cell receptor which is produced during maturation. Immature T-cells will lack this and not be able to function. The CD4 and the CD8 molecules help stabilize the connection between the antigen and the T-cell receptor. Mature cells leave the thymus and spread out in the lymphatic tissues. CD4 proteins are a cluster of differentiation molecules which form on T cells during maturation in the thymus. Again, don't get overwhelmed, just remember they stabilize the connection. There are several types of T cells produced. The first one we are going to consider are the helper T cells. The stimulation by interleukin-2 causes the helper T cell to produce more interleukin-2 and to undergo differentiation and produce other cytokines. Here you see the helper T cells stimulating B cells, memory T cells, and cytoxic T cells. Cytokines are sometimes called the hormones of immune response. They're the result of both paracrine and autocrine secretions. Do you remember what paracrine and autocrine secretions, secretion involves? When helper T cells make contact with an antigen presenting cell and are stimulated by the interleukin-1 from the antigen presenting cell, the helper T cell produces interleukin-2, which stimulates the cells that produce it, produces it. This is autocrine secretion. T cells also produce interleukin-4. The interleukin-4 that is secreted by type 2 helper T cells is necessary for the plasma B cells to produce antibodies. The helper T cells also secrete cytokines that stimulate macrophages and cytokines that will cause chemotaxis attracting macrophages, neutrophils, and basophils that are in the area. This diagram shows type 1 helper T cell releasing interleukin-2 that stimulates the, the cytoxic T cells, and type 2 helper T cells re releasing interleukin-4, which stimulates B cells, proliferation, and differentiation. Another type of T cell are the cytoxic T cells. The cytoxic T cells target tumors, and viral infected cells, foreign grafts, and transplants. They, they recognize class 1 MHC antigen complex on the target of surface cells. They release enzymes, toxic cytokines, and perforins. Perforins make holes in the cell membrane of their target. This kills the cell as the cytoplasm leaks out. Cytoxic T cells often are responsible for transplant failure. Here we see a cytoxic T cell in action. It releases enzymes, perforins, and toxic cytokines that damage the target cells. That's great if it's a tumor cell. 
Not so great if it's a transplanted kidney. The third type of T cells are memory T cells. Memory T cells remember the antigen and how the body responded to it. This makes a secondary immune response faster. The downside of this memory is they sometimes make it difficult to get a successful transplant. There's a lot we don't know about suppressor T cells. Suppressor T cells are also known as regulatory T cells and they work in a variety of ways. Some of them su suppress the proliferation of B cells and T cells. They also may be involved in the tolerance of self antigens. And then last but not least, we have natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are another type of lymphocytes. They're not a T cell nor a, a B cell. They do not bind with antigens, but recognize chemical changes on the surface of cells that have been infected by viruses, on the surface of malignant cells, or on the surface of cells that have intercellular microbes. They are part of the innate or nonspecific immunity. They are not specific for a single antigen. They also will attack antibody-coated cells. They have crystalline fragment receptors that will bind with the crystalline fragment region of the antibody. This slide shows us how natural killer cells know when to attack. Normal cells usually have class 1 MHC molecules that are recognized by the natural killer cell as inhibitory receptors. The natural killer cell will not attack if the connection is made between the class 1 MHC molecule and the inhibitory receptor. Abnormal cells will lack the class 1 MHC molecule necessary to prevent attack. And so the natural killer cell, when it finds no, uh, nothing to attach to its inhibitory receptor, will attack and kill that cell.